Hello everyone and welcome to The Hidden Lives of Writers. My name is Fiona Snickers and I'm joined by my co-host Gail Schimmel. Hi Fiona, how are you doing? I am doing well and I'd like to know how your writing week has been doing. It's a bit boring, but in a really nice way. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I've spoken about, I've refound my discipline and I think I, I just want to emphasize that 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 role of discipline in writing, how quickly a book grows when you're disciplined about showing up every day and doing your words. And yes, for me at the moment, it's a very ambitious a thousand words a day. Mm-hmm. But whether it's 200 words a day or a thousand words a day or your favorite 300 words a day, if you do it, it grows. And it's it's actually... I mean, I know it sounds so stupid that I'm amazed by it, but it is just amazing how quickly it happens. And obviously, especially if you are being ambitious in your word count. But so I'm in that very well disciplined, very productive, moving fast, can see the end stage of writing. Lovely. And what about you? Well, I was away traveling for a while and I was very proud of myself that I managed to keep up my Uh, writing Mm. while I was um, moving around and um, I really thought I was doing so well until I came to look over what I'd written and edit it and uh, I just found that I had been flinging words at the page and many of them were not sticking and had to go and I've also been struggling with how much more difficult it is to write my ambitious literary novel rather than writing my genre novel because I'm doing both at the same time and I'm I'm finding that my thriller the genre novel mm. those words are sticking I I'm putting them down and they are staying I might change a word here and there but generally it's fine I read over it and it's fine it's doing what I wanted it to do and then the work on the literary novel I'm still cutting away thousands of words every oh. month And the pressure is, what I'm feeling is, this needs to be good, it needs to be original, Mm. it needs to be saying something new. And stuff that I'm I'm reading over and and looking at, it's telling rather than showing, it's using too many words, it's too flowery, it's trying to do things that it shouldn't really be doing. So I've just been a bit disappointed with myself over Don't the last couple of Don't be disappointed with yourself. You're not the disappointment. It's the genre that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I like that attitude. <laughs> and I think, you know, I think we've spoken about sitting down to write a great novel mm. is a very overwhelming thing to do. Sitting down to write a nice novel is much easier than sitting down to write a great novel. And it sounds like you're trying to sit down and write a great novel. Yeah, I think I am. I I think I'm putting too much pressure on this, that this is sort of my final word on everything. (laughs) Really, (laughs) it can't be, and that's why I keep hacking away great big chunks of it. I believe that we have been reading the same book. Yes, and of course it was a case of me following your lead, (laughs) but now we've both decided that we want to talk about this book today. So we thought, okay, fine, let's both talk about it. So what is the book that we want to talk about? So the book is The Husbands by Holly Gramazia. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, G-R-A-M-A-Z-I-A, because everybody should read it, so I hope you wrote that down quickly. Fiona, do you want to explain the concept Okay, um, so it it is what they call a high-concept novel where the idea behind the novel is kind of the the substance of it. And the idea of this novel is that a a woman's been out, uh, she lives in London, and she returns home and finds a husband living in her house. And she's never seen him before, she doesn't know who he is, but he clearly thinks that he's married to her and... At some point, he goes up into the attic to get something and he disappears. And another husband comes back down the stairs. And she she quickly gets the idea of it that um, for as long as she's kind of in the space, the attic will throw a new husband at her. Every time one goes up to the attic, it will be replaced by a new one. You've got to get them up to the attic, though. Yes, and there's some that she can't wait to send back (laughs) up to the attic and there's some that she'd like to keep for a bit longer. So they are the husbands and they they run into the hundreds of husbands after a while. 
So how, how did you react to this I just I found it such fun. I really, I love a clever high concept novel where, where there's just a clever idea that this, as soon as you've read it, you're like, oh, why didn't I think of that? Why mm. didn't I write this book? Mm. And I think that's one of the thing about these high concept novels that the moment the idea's in your head, it's perfectly obvious that, of course, someone should have written a book about husbands coming out of that. <laughs> of course. But... <laughs> But nobody would have thought about it. I really loved it, and it's light, it's fun, but it does do it. It has that midnight library thing of different possibilities that your life has, mm. and I, I found that end very interesting. Very, very interesting. interesting. In many ways, it's it's a multiverse novel. Yes, it is because a multiverse novel because she starts novel. to realize that these are different versions of her mm. life, and that they are kind of carrying on without her. Mm. And when she decides, okay, not this husband, let's try the next one, that life does sort of continue in some kind of way. And to me, the really interesting part was how deeply it made me think about the choices we make mm. and what having too many choices in your life can do for you. That was an interesting aspect, but yes, absolutely. And I loved road not taken novels, sliding door novels. So it had all those elements for me. So another novelist whose work we would highly recommend is our guest today. Our guest today is Mputumi Ntabeni. He is the author of The Broken River Tent, which won the UJ Prize for Debut Fiction and also of the novel The Wanderers. Both his books have been long-listed for the Sunday Times Prize. And Push, hello and welcome. Thank you for your time. Good morning, Fina. And uh, it's been wonderful being in Joburg this week. I miss Cape Town, though, <laughs> with, with, with all the rains and the floods. <laughs> but uh, I have I, Cape Town. I mean, yes, I have yeah. had I have had wonderful weather here uh, as a reprieve from Cape Town, Gail. So exactly. I know, I know, but exactly. I, I miss it anyway. <laughs> it's my city. <laughs> Push, let's jump right in to ask you, given that you have been out of your comfort zone of Cape Town, how has your writing week been? Oh, it's been messy. <laughs> <laughs> I will just come off and say that. But look, uh, it's it's normally for me to do that because I don't write full time. I write only when I have the space to write. So I, I can't afford uh, sitting like, you know, the the people, the writers who say, do the discipline thing every morning and then every evening or whatever. I, I don't do that, unfortunately. But um, not because I'm I'm not a, a, f a full-time writer, but also be it's, uh, it's the methods are different because I write mostly historical fiction. So um, I have to read a lot of history before I can write. So I usually just read, 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 read a lot. And then when there come a moment where I feel things are overflowing in my head, and then that's when I think I'm ready for writing. So I, I, it's never a time that is allocated by myself. Today, I've, I've, I, when people even ask me, if why do you write? I was like, I write because I read a lot. <laughs> I think I, I'm, I, I, I still identify as a reader. And then as a reader, that developed an opinion which is why I'm a writer, I suppose. <laughs> and uh, when you are busy with a novel project and you're in the thick of writing and those ideas are overflowing from your head, what does your process look like? It's like the floodgates. Mm -hmm. I, I sometimes just wake up at 3 o'clock or even 11 o'clock uh, at night. Or Usually my, my writing process, if I have one, <laughs> <laughs> is I, I would uh, do supper and then wash dishes for the kids and then when the kids are, are sleeping and then that's when I start writing because I also do a lot of book reviews and then that's when I usually do that, uh, write my book reviews but then sometimes my own writing manuscript takes over and then I set aside because something in my book review reminded me of where I was perhaps in my own manuscript. And then I set it aside and then I, I, I go on into my own manuscript. And the next thing I hear my children at the back and then and I was like, oh, it's six o'clock already. Oh, wow. <laughs> so you yeah. are three So that's how, that's how I, I do it. Not all the time, but when it, it happens, it happens like that for me. That's why I'm saying it's like the floodgates for me. That's amazing. And I'm interested in 
That process you took, you said your head gets fuller and fuller and then suddenly it overflows and you're ready to write. Has a character come to you in that time of your head getting fuller and fuller? Before you're ready to write, does a character have to come to you who's going to tell that story? Yes, actually. Unfortunately, that is how I write. If I haven't imagined a character on my head, I can't uh, express myself. It always, my writing always starts with the character in my head. Like, for instance, in the Broken River Tent, I use the Kosa Chief Makoma as the background or a skeleton of the ideas I was trying to uh, propagate there. And in the, in my current uh, manuscript, I'm using the first black uh, theologian that studied in, in the West, in Scotland, who is uh, Soga. And then, so I, I'm actually, uh, to be honest, uh, propagating my my ideas and ideas of my time through his biological facts. It's uh, it's interesting in a sense that, uh, and uh, believe you me, I did not plan this, uh, but I realized uh, when I was it, I was uh, in the middle of of doing this manuscript that uh, Soga went to Scotland was born in an area that is not far from where I was born, went to Scotland at 14 years, very, 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 very young, and married a Scottish woman, had children with, with her, five that that survived, and they were the so-called first in everything, first a veterinary science of South Africa, and I'm saying, I'm, mark my words, I'm not saying first black, I'm saying first, yes. first vet, of South Africa, which is why the University of Pretoria now is named after him, uh, Jotelo Soga. And her children, like first black lawyer, first journalist, first everything, they were a wonderful family. So they fascinate me and all that stuff. And uh, he died very young at 42. And his wife, Janet, did a very good job raising up the, the kids and then uh, giving them uh, all that, as I said, academic uh, education on her own. And it's quite uh, interesting to me because I was also married to a Scottish woman who unfortunately died early this year. And I have children with her and all those things. And then as I was writing the manuscript, I looked at it and I was like, there's so many similarities between myself and Soga. And now it feels like it's one of the manuscripts I was supposed to write. Mm. But initially, I hadn't planned it, if you if you can believe me. So it's quite interesting. <laughs> So you write historical fiction. When one is doing that, or, or rather, I want to know how you see it, what do you owe to the actual facts of the past and what do you owe to the literary imagination? How much freedom do you feel to sort of recast the past imaginatively or do you really want to stick to what actually happened in as much as we know what that is? Yeah, that, that's that's a that's a great question. Actually, look, there are different kinds of fic- historical fiction. You will see people, and uh, they will take an event out of history, and then they will imagine uh, characters around that event. That is not my kind of historical fiction. My kind of historical fiction is is taking the actual historical figure that existed, that whose uh, facts we all know. And then I reimagine him uh, as a, a, a like in, in a way, my historical fiction is he tries to personalize history, and then so I try to put uh, the psychological insights behind the the historical drama that was happening around them, which is probably the reason why, even though I initially wanted to use only ordinary people. But I was forced to use figures of history that were at the center of it. So when I was uh, writing f- about the frontier wars, the, what struck me most was the fact that there is a lot that is written about the frontier wars, but it's all written by British officials, British soldiers, British minis- missionaries. There was never any uh, opinion on it that is written from the closer point of view. And that is what I wanted to do, to write it from the closer point of view. And then the only person I could do that successfully with, who who seemed to me was at the center of it, was Chief Magoma, who was a a son of uh, Ngosu Unriga. So Amakosa, most people don't know this, fought with the English the longest than any other person. Like I know we talk about French hundred years wars. 
I'm across a 402 years with the English. So that land, especially in the Eastern Cape, was not just handed over to the British colonials. It was fought for. The blood was spilt on it. And there were nine major frontier wars. And out of those major frontier wars, there was at least uh, four that were led by Ngosuma Goma. And that is uh, the reason why I decided to use him as, as my main character, because he is a sender of all those frontier wars. I, of course, I use my imagination uh, to imagine what led to the, the decisions that were made there, the psychological insights. So I, I, I used what I call an informed imagination. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I read about the character, and then now, and, and uh, I remember when I was younger, when I was reading, I, I would always, when I was writing, I would always try to to refer to my to my research material and all that stuff and all that stuff. But now I think I I have grown enough to understand that when you are writing historical fiction, you you must read, you must read a lot of history. But then there comes a time you must set it aside, mm-hmm. all that mm-hmm. research. Mm-hmm. So you must trust your own instinct, your own imagination, and your own uh, process of remembering what you have written. Because the mind is a very intelligent thing. When you, as you read, it processes, and it will process it in a manner that is uh, intelligent to you and the readers. So do not feel yourself forced that you must always be referring to historical facts and dates and all those things. Let the mind take its own process. And then, like, as you know, as a writer, you know that, especially the first draft, write everything, and then you can edit later. Mm. Yeah. I want to take a step back and talk about your origin story. Um, because you didn't start as a typical writing background, um, you started, I think you said, well, while we were talking before we started recording, studying architecture. So how did you go from that? Well, and as a child, had, did you have any interest in writing? How did you go from architecture to writing? Yeah, it's a, I have a, a lot of my friends who are architects. Uh, and generally, uh, in the, uh, what you call, uh, Built environment, uh, they they feel that the the field has become too technical, so uh, most of them went there thinking that it's a creative field, mm. and so they get frustrated when they are there, and most of them <coughs> either end up becoming artists. Mm. I mean, that's more I, typical. I, yeah, that, that's I, yeah, more yeah. Typical. I, I, you can uh, believe you me. I know I know a lot of architects mm. that have turned into artists, and I have a friend now who has a, an exhibition even in New York. He is making a lot of money than all of us. So I'm <laughs> rethinking my choice of deciding to be a writer. <laughs> Push, everyone's making more money than a writer. Of course, of course, everybody makes more money than writers. There's no money in it, except perhaps for, perhaps for the likes of Jem Kutze. Mm. But we cannot all win Booker Prizes twice. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the thing I'm trying to say is that I, I think myself... Uh, I felt things are, uh, were a little bit uh, too technical. And then uh, I remember my friend the other day was telling me that uh, if I wanted to be an engineer, I would have started engineering. <laughs> I thought this is a creative field, I, but it's not. And um, you, you, I'm sure you, you know Vernon Head also is an architect. Mm. And now he's uh, exploring his own creative uh, spirit in writing and in, in bed mm. watching. It's his interest. So I think uh, when you're in that field and you've got a, a creative mind, you need a way of blowing steam. Mm. Otherwise, you get frustrated. You'll be, you'll be uh, surprised how tedious and boring the built environment is these days because we're just all building blocks. Mm. <laughs> and they understand mm. even like architecturally, there isn't anything that is inspiring. And uh, it's, uh, it's a field now that is controlled more by bankers than uh, anything else. There isn't an opportunity to be creative, so to mm. say. Yeah. But anyway, it's, uh, as you say, he, he, he has no money in writing, and so you have, it's a living. So my first choice when I, I applied at Vids was uh, a beacon. And my second choice was actually, uh, because I was still hung up on the medical field, was a pharmacology. <laughs> so I thought I was going to do pharmacy, a B-farm. And then my third choice was uh, an architect because I had uh, watched 
uh, a movie that week when I was uh, uh, applying the, a movie called The Fountain. So uh, the character of the architect there seemed interesting enough. I did not know anything about <laughs> architecture. So the, the funny thing is when I got to VITS, I realized that uh, the registration for, for commerce were actually on a Wednesday. <laughs> and, and I got there on a on a Monday, so I had to find something to do. <laughs> oh so I went to the the thing, and then uh, I sat at I remember at the Senate House. So I bought I bought some lunch, and I went. You know, at Vets, there is a pool where the uh, 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 some little bit of uh, gardens. I I went to sit there to eat my lunch while I was trying to think what else I was going to do because I had traveled all the way from the Eastern Cape and because I was born in Queenstown. So I was even thinking, but where am I going to sleep tonight? You understand that? Because the registration is only on, on Wednesday. I don't know how I miscalculated that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but then as I was sitting there, I looked in front of me. There was a building that was written, Robert Moffat, uh, faculty of architecture and I was thinking huh I applied there also and they, they, they said I could come and then I went there and I was thinking let me just go and see what's going on because I could see there was activity inside the house on the foyer and then when I got there everybody came to me hi hi how are you and all that stuff and I was like why am I say a celebrity here and then I realized later on that uh they knew, of course, that I had applied and they had, they were hoping that I would choose. And I was the only black person who had applied that year. Oh, wow. So that's why I was a celebrity. We're talking about 1988 now. <laughs> that's why I was a celebrity. And then I went with the flow. <laughs> like, Thank God our black student turned up. <laughs> yes. So I went with the flow and then that's, that's how it happened, basically. Oh, wow. That, that is. is the most extraordinary <laughs> origin story we have heard, I think. <laughs> uh, well, it's true. <laughs> yeah, so, I, and then uh, luckily enough, once I had a, a student card, now I could go and register for res. So I had a place to sleep that night. <laughs> oh. So then at Vets, we were only allowed to stay at Glen Thomas, which was a, a Vets res at uh, Baragwanath Hospital. So that's where the black students stayed there. Wow, yeah, 1988. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, there were other students that uh, uh, were, things were already changing. So even in the men's race, uh, some people were staying in the men's race. But predominantly, Glyn Thomas House was a black student resident. Because I started at Wits in 92, and I'm sure by then the races were completely multiracial. Yeah, no, no. Even when I, I was I was there, they were multiracial. It's just that predominantly the black people stayed okay. there, and it was a hub of uh, Wits' political okay. activism. So I, I wanted to stay where people who look like me stayed. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and, and Especially it, as the only black student in your year. <laughs> it, helped, it, helped, it, it helped me because in my faculty there were just too many uh, you know, so at least uh, uh, in the evening I could go back to and see some black skins. But you know, there, there were some two Indians in the whole faculty. Let me not say that it's just in the department. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now I'm interested because in the Broken River Tent, your character Pila describes himself as a failed architect and he talks about. Um, spending nine years in Germany and, uh, you know, becomes increasingly interested in the, the frontier wars and the history and his own kind of personal connection to that history. Um, is your character you? Is he a kind of <laughs> a persona for, for you, the, the author? Yeah, no, uh, I, no. It's, uh, it's not, but uh, as you know, as a writer, it's impossible to write a character without lending a little bit of your own personal experience to him. Also, it makes your voice more authentic because you know what you're talking about. And as much as uh, I would I would say Pilar is not my own persona, but there are a lot of similarities. Uh, that I, I gave him a lot of my own experiences. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, the fact that he was born in the 
rural village outside Queenstown called Zingutu. That that's my home. You understand? So that that that, that is mine. And the fact that uh, he came back from Europe just at the time to bury his own father, and that is my personal experience. And uh, the feeling of dislocation uh, of because he has been outside of South Africa for a long time, and uh, it's that's also my personal experience. And uh, yeah, and then he, I almost myself almost came back at a time that uh, Mandela was being crowned as a president, and uh, I was just as dis. A little bit located. I don't want to say disillusioned, but dislocated. I had my experiences. I, I work when I was at university. I worked for as, uh, the ANC as a researcher quite for some time. Not work formally, like as part of my activism and all those things. So I had experiences in, in the organization. By the time Mandela took over, I had seen the cracks already, and some of them scared me. You've given me a question that's not even on my quite long list of questions. Um, do you think as someone who reads so much history and writes about history, it gives you a different way of looking at the present and po- the politics of the present? Most definitely. I, 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 I agree with that. And it's the most frustrating thing actually in the world because you think you know the mistakes that were made in the past but you have no power to influence people because the writers like to think that they have power to influence. Mm-hmm. I beg to disagree. People uh, always learn too late. But we are writers. We have to do our bit, and uh, if we don't write, it bans us. So we have to write, even if people will look back and say, there were people who saw this, but we did not listen to us. But that's not only about South Africa. That's just the world mm-hmm. general over. I mean, the the global politics as it is, they are a mess. Uh, my my children are half British, so when I go to the UK and I look at, at what is happening there, I always come back with more renewed hope for South Africa. And I was like, at least we're not in that mess yet. <laughs> we are not in that mess yet. And uh, unfortunately, I think Plato saw it a long time ago that a, a system of democracy is a very sophisticated system that requires an informed demos, and that is an informed public. If you don't, if you do not inform the public, then it comes with all the diseases that we're seeing it now. And uh, unfortunately, Camus saw this: that when democracy is sick, it's always fascism that comes to its uh, table, not to uh, treat it or make it feel better, but to suffocate it further. Mm. And uh, mm. everywhere you look now in global politics, there's a rise of fascism. That uh, and and I mean, I I, I include uh, Zuma on that because Zuma is an African fascist. Your character Pila suffers from a kind of insecurity and imposter syndrome because he believes he's too respectable, too polite. He likes the soft life too much. He feels as though these things undermine him as a a radical and as an activist, are these insecurities that you have personally felt for you to put them on him? Most definitely. And uh, I, <clears throat> I think it comes with a liberal uh, point of view, which I'm partially liberal, but not totally liberal. Uh, in, in, in any case, I'm not liberal in the Western uh, so-called way. But the thing is... Uh, the character of of Pillar is, uh, or oh, I did, I wanted him to be a very well informed person, and uh, and showcases the hypocrisy of the so called well informed people, because in the most of the time they know what is right, and then by then they don't usually work with what is right. They they they. I mean, we can all of us go outside and toy toy each time. Uh, something happens, and we 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 pretend that we are all about uh, uh, to serve the poor people, but in the end of the day, we serve the capitalist system that is oppressing everybody else. And then, the, by the fact that you own an iPhone and all those things, you are always you are already part of the problem. 
And we all know that. And we, we don't know how to answer or make ourselves much better people. Uh, sh what should we do? Should we not buy iPhones? So, uh, but then if, we, 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 if you are buying an iPhone and then you are also with the same breath saying you are against uh, the, the, the child labor in Congo, mm -hmm. you are a hypocrite. There's no way of looking away from that. And then uh, these are sub, uh, subterranean and subconscious uh, small things I wanted to excavate in, uh, through the, the, the character of Pillar. You're giving us a lot to think about, and maybe we're going to be a little bit depressed about the world <laughs> after this. <laughs> oh, no, I hope I wasn't going to do that, but uh, I, I can't help being myself. And uh, I, I, I'm not myself a very depressed person, but I uh, uh, can see an element of melancholia in my character, which is what I transferred to the character of Pillar. I want to talk about a slightly more positive thing, but it's got a <laughs> negative side as well. Your first book was very well received, won the UJ Prize, um, very well received. What does that do to a writer when your debut has been so successful? Does it make carrying on writing, writing the next book frightening? Or does it make like, well, I'm obviously very good at what I'm doing, so <laughs> I'm going to, this, this should be easy. <laughs> Yeah. No, I still carry an imposter free, uh, syndrome. And uh, I think almost every r r writer uh, carries that throughout the, uh, their, their career, no matter how successful they have been. But I was also lucky in a sense that uh, although uh, writing or publication-wise, The Broken River Tent came out uh, first, but writing-wise, The Wanderers, actually, is the manuscript I finished first. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, I understand. So I had already written The, 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 the Wanderers. Uh, it had been rejected by uh, 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 publishers, including Tabby, so eventually... Uh, published the Broken River Tent, and he because he says, okay, this this the Wanderers does not work for us. We feel it's a little bit too self indulgent, blah blah blah. And uh, but uh, feel free to send us anything else that you you have in the future. And I was like, oh well, the future is now. I said, <laughs> <laughs> I send her the Broken River Tent, and then she was like, oh, I love this. I think we're gonna go with this one. But I did not actually uh, want to uh, send the, the manuscript of the Broken River Tent because I had from the start realized that it's not going to be one book mm. because I had done a lot of research and a lot of material I had written uh, on that. And then I knew that but as one book, it will be too big a book. So I, I, had, I was already having designs of... Um, uh, doing it as a trilogy, mm. so uh, which now I'm currently writing book two of. So now, uh, how I did then? Uh, I said, okay, I have all this material, and I've written this this uh, because sometimes I write. The, the thing I love most about being in Europe is uh, trains. For whatever reason, for whatever reason, my mind becomes fluid on the trains, and I write a lot on the trains. You understand? It yes. works for my mind. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. You understand? So sometimes I would like, ooh, I just want to take a train to Switzerland, and then if I have money, it's it's a little bit cheaper in yes. Europe than than here. So I just take a train to Switzerland, spend one day, and go back. <laughs> the the whole point was to write, and <laughs> that three days on the ride rather than <laughs> rather than the holidays in Switzerland. I was like, I don't understand people who go to holiday in Switzerland. They just know everywhere. <laughs> what do you do here? <laughs> you understand? And it's lucky that during winters the, the the tickets will be cheaper. So I would like go and do that just to have that three or four days of writing non-stop there's a writing tip that we have never heard before <laughs> go on, we've, we suggest that people go for walks to clear yeah. their mind but oh, to go on a train are, journey the trains are, are, per, are, are perfect for me mm. mind you for whatever reason the, the, the planes don't work for me the airports don't work but train stations and trains they, they work I Actually, don't know yeah, why. I, I don't quite know well why. On train yeah. As well. I don't get to do it often, but I write quite well yeah. on a train. So yeah. Uh, so I I I published the Broken River Tent as book two as book one 
of the, the River People trilogy. And the River People is basically looking into the early history of the Eastern Cape through the point of view of Amakosa. Mm -hmm. So uh, on the Broken River Tent, I concentrate more on the military operations and all that stuff. But on, on book two, which I'm, I'm still a little bit uh, in two minds how to call it because uh, I am calling it for now The Marked Man. Uh, story, <laughs> story for another time. <laughs> the, 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 and then, so, but then the whole point there is that I'm looking at it through uh, as a, a spiritual clashes between the Western point of view and the African point of view. Western religion, in particular Christianity, and the the, the closer spirituality, and you would notice uh, in the character of of Pila, I had already introduced the concept of Ukutwasa, which means like seeing things that other people are not seeing, yes. as uh, whether Upila is being called to be Ikeha or not. I left it vague, hanging deliberately because I knew that I would deal with it in book two. So yes. in book two, Pila is still there, although this time he is conversing more with uh, Tio Soga and uh, J.T. Fanda Kemp, because Fanda Kemp was the first missionary that was sent to Amakosa that arrived in 1799. A beautiful man with... Uh, I know missionaries get a, a bad uh, rap for because... Eventually, they, they did become instruments of British imperialism. But the first ones were actually uh, what I would call real apostles. Mm. They, 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 mm. did it, they did it without the government uh, imperialistic notion. He, he was a noble man. So this time now on book two, I'm looking more on the spiritualities than the, the spiritual clashes than the military clashes. Yeah, I wanted to ask about that. In the Broken River Tent, um, we have this character, Pilo, who very much lives in the modern world, and we have the hard history of the Eastern Cape. And then you introduce this supernatural element where he's talking to somebody who is not present in the, the physical sense of the term, and we start to realize he can see this person and he's communing with this person. So it's always a decision as a writer to introduce a supernatural element. Um, was it something that you were driven to do because of your interest in African spirituality? Uh, most definitely. But uh, the thing I, I struggled most, uh, I wanted to uh, expose African spirituality in a much more kinder way than the traditional manner that Christians exposes it. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, talk about it. But also, it was a, should I call it plot decision? Uh, mm -hmm. Because I was not satisfied in putting uh, Makoma into the distant past. Mm -hmm. I wanted him to, to converse with him in our present day. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. understand? Because I, I, this is what I, I like. I want to make history. I want it to make it relevant yeah. to us now. And I want people to understand the seeds that bore the harvest uh, uh, or the fruits that were harvesting now. Do you understand? And so it, it, it seemed to me like uh, a an uh, how can I say, how can I say an apt or something of a fate that uh, Amakosa in their spirituality, it's a common thing to uh, communicate and commune with the spirits of the dead. So uh, I knew that, but from the closer point of view, people would not see anything strange about it. You understand? Mm. And as a result, even today, people really like that 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 element in the book. Uh, in the Western point of view, of course. People find it strange, but I get away with it because I I, I, I just call it fantasy. <laughs> fantasy <laughs> and all that stuff. And um you will uh you'll be interested to know that uh that aspect of uh fantasy and communicating with the spirits and trying to understand uh what is presently happening in our lives from the point of view of the dead, uh, not just the dead, the ancestors, because the ancestors in the Kosa, um, 
spirituality. Not everybody becomes an ancestor. Oh. It's yeah, no, it's uh, it's like what you would call in Christian spirituality a saint. Only those who have lived a uh, uh, good lives become ancestors. So not not everybody just becomes an ancestor. I you understand? Uh, I do. Yeah, it's like that. So you have to have uh, lived a very good life that impacted in a good way on the overall community that you become an ancestor. And then what happens to the others? Oh, well, we don't know. <laughs> don't, don't the Christians put them in hell. But uh, the, the, the cause of spirituality is very quiet about that. Okay. It, it doesn't have the notion of hell. It, it, it just doesn't. It, 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 it actually, to be honest, it, it actually believes that the ancestors will convert even the ones that are dead when were bad people. It understands it that way that it's the duty of the ancestors even to con to convert the the bad people, and which is uh, the drama I'm currently doing now in book two, and also in 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 the Western uh, genealogy and all that stuff that is not uh, uh, far fetched. Dante has done it, and I I in the Broken River tent I I throw a little bit of uh, suggestion to show that, but don't think and judge us because I mean Dante takes his characters into the Lanosa underworld and uh, before Dante Homer did it which is the foundation of western uh, literature so I, I, I find it strange that people think it's uh, strange that I did that <laughs> I'm always very interested you're writing and I'm listening to your beautiful clicks and feeling so aware that I'm going to pronounce Cosa <laughs> in such a white way, but <laughs> that is where I'm at. Um, you're a Cosa man writing about Cosa history and you're writing in English. Talk to me about that decision and if it makes it harder to, to interpret that world into English. Almost definitely. It, it, it makes it, uh, perhaps, uh, it gives it a challenge, if I, I may, I may say. Uh, so, uh, because uh, the world views are different, and this is uh, it comes back to Fiona's uh, answer why I brought uh, my coma because the, I felt that uh, Pillar has lost that Cosa original worldview. So I needed my coma to bring it back to bring it back to us as the people living in in the current stage in the I mean in the current era and uh my sister uh once gave me a an amazing compliment uh because I think she was the first person to see this she says but even the english that pila speaks and the english that Malcoma speaks are different and i think it's amazing what you did there because as a closer person, I can feel that the my comma's English has uh, has been closerized. Okay. She called it, <laughs> my, and that is the point I was trying to make with Malcolm because I wanted him to bring a, a, a worldview, a closer worldview. That is, uh, I feel already tainted in Pillar, but with him it will be pure. And so, a, a closer person when he reads uh, the, the the species of of uh, of my comma, he can identify that this is how Kosa speaks. It's just done. It's just being done in English now. And so, uh, to answer you, yes, it was a little bit uh, difficult. But you know what made it e easy for me? Mm. I have a, a, a an academic article I wrote uh, about this. So I was uh, pretending to be an academic, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I needed to say something, uh, but I couldn't say it proper way in 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 a simple way. So I needed the complex ways of academia <laughs> to say it. But what I was trying to say is that uh, what I found most beautiful about Homer or the Homeric literature is that Homer or the Homers were writing at the time when oral history was changing into written history and uh, writing and living at that time. And so it's so much easy for me to relate to that literature. Mm -hmm. You understand? Because I can see it so very well that it speaks directly to me. And even in the vocab, in the tonalities, it speaks uh, similar ways that the Kosas uh, were speaking. And then I realized 
during the frontier wars and this is the time the Tosa oral history itself was 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 uh, uh, transforming into a, a written language mm-hmm. my friend uh, Tembeka Ngai told me who's the advocate and I mm-hmm. are organizing a combo book festival in East London for November and uh, what we're trying to do with that festival is to uh, make a, a a how can I call it a recon of the Eastern Cape past and uh, because last year the, the, we we've been talking about this for a long time but then it was instigated urgently in a manner of when we were last year at Grahamstown and attending a, a ceremony of a celebration of Tosa it's a Tosa as a written language 200 years of it so it was like we need to 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 talk about these things so in any case in in this in this book festival that we're organizing unfortunately we only want for now to deal with books that are, have an eastern cape theme mm. that has an eastern cape theme it's i think it also makes us a little bit unique because mm. it hasn't been done yet mm. you understand mm. so we look at this and uh, so the black the first black intellectuals are there are from there in the eastern cape uh, from the lovedale and all those things so when i look at those things and there are other things like for instance I was asking uh, some of my friends who are uh, strong feminists, and I was like, in all your writings, uh, like, guys, I never see you talk about the impact of Christianity in freeing uh, women from Tosa Pytra. Why do you avoid this, 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 this topic? And then she was like, that's an interesting thing. And I was like, I'm giving you a session on that, on that book festival. So we, we, we must talk about that also. Because, yes, there's a lot of bad things that the missionaries did. But uh, there's a lot of other stuff that we we, ne- we neglect to mention. Because it's not coincidentally that uh, Tosa women uh, formed more than 83% of the first converts into Christianity. There was a reason from that. So if you like you are a young girl on an arranged marriage, your husband is abusive, mm-hmm. your only solace and your only refuge will be to go to the missionaries. Mm-hmm. You understand? And and live an individual life. And and uh, I mean this this thing also of uh, there were bad things that were done in uh, in those eras, in those era from both sides. So uh, I think we are in a era or time whereby we are also, I think, ready to hear an adulterated form of truth and historical truth that does not necessarily design to favor one side or, or the other. Because, I mean, I, the archives will humble you, and they humbled me. And uh, I, cause I even take the simple things about frontier wars. It is very simplistic to talk about frontier wars as the wars between blacks and whites. It's much mm. more complex than that, mm. because uh, there were there were Tosa chiefs who were fight who were who were fighting with Africaners as their al- allies mm. to defeat other Tosa chiefs, and there were Tosa chiefs who were fighting with the British. To defeat the other, the other, and I'm like, this thing of uh, this was just uh, white and uh, mm-hmm. and uh, thing. It's just simplifying it. Of course, the the way to talk about uh, frontier wars that I'm comfortable with is when you say there were the lo- the the wars of land dispossession. That's a proper definition. Mm. You understand? Mm. Not the racial element. Mm. You understand? Mm. I'm not trying to be political correct when I say that. It's just the truth of what the archives have learned from the archives. And the role of the Amamfengu people yes. is especially contested and complex and and difficult to understand. And that's what you deal with in The Wanderers. Exactly. So um, coming back to the role of women, in The Wanderers you inhabit this female persona of Ruru and you portray her in different ways, one of which is through the second person. Uh, You look and you see this and you experience that. Um, And then you also write in her voice when she's writing to her mother and we see her own 
voice coming through, a young voice, a, a voice that uses slang and, and modern terms and so on. Uh, how did you inhabit that female persona? How did you prepare yourself to do that? <laughs> yeah, that actually, I must say, I still even myself can't, can't believe that I, I was, let me not say stupid, brave <laughs> enough, <laughs> brave enough to, to do that. But the, the thing about uh, being young and naive is that you think you can do anything. So I'm happy that I wrote that first when I, I, I still felt that I can do anything. But uh, to be honest, uh, I have also a, a, a fortune, I'm fortunate in a sense that I was raised by women. And, uh, my mother was a single mom. Her best support system was her sister, who was my aunt. And uh, when I was writing uh, The Wanderers at first, I did not even call it The Wanderers. I call it with autumn in my heart then. There goes that melancholy again. <laughs> so with autumn in, in in my heart. And then when I was writing it, I was writing it more... Uh, initially as uh, trying to investigate the the history of uh, ANC in exile, which is what I did in Tanzania and all that stuff. But then now, when I revisited it, after Broken River 10 has, had already been uh, published, I revisited it at a very difficult time in my life. Uh, it was the middle of... Uh, the uh, COVID pandemic. My mother was dying of cancer. I drove from uh, Cape Town without a license, uh, without a permit to Eastern Cape. And I was like, I'm not going to be sitting here when my mother is dying. So I drove all night. And then uh, in one roadblock at Sisikama where they demanded the permit, I said, I don't have it. My, just, my mother is dying. I need to be there. And then they understood it. They let me pass. You understand, and so uh, it was a strange time in my life because I was remembering a lot of things. You know what uh, the threat of that will do with you. So when I was taking my mother to a hospital for all these treatments every morning, and then because she refused to stay there, so I will take her every morning and then bring her up again, and then we will go sit at the beach and uh, next to a place where, when we were young, she used to buy us ice cream. And then sometimes she had no uh, strength for it in the car, she would sleep. But sometimes she would wake up and then she would look at it and then she would talk about those days. And then she's like in between worlds herself and all those things. So when I revisited Wanderers, that was that time. And then uh, the meaning of life and death was very prominent in my mind then, which is how I twisted that book in, into into uh, interrogating my own personal history and life, and again all those things I I, I lend them to Ruru, and uh, it helps that uh, the young Ruru is literally, if I can say, my daughter who is now uh, an adult, a very wonderful child. And so I, I, I heard her voice when I was uh, writing that voice of Ruru, the letters. Mm -hmm. So it's her voice that, that, that helped me there on the letters. On the adult Ruru, I don't know, I think it's a combination of most uh, women in my life that includes even my sisters, my mother. My, it's quite a combination of, of, of the few. But uh, in that one, also, you had noticed I was trying to depict the position of an educated black female in our society now. Uh, how would she navigate all these things? Okay. Before we ask you our final question, there's one question that I'm very, very curious about, and that is your role as a well-known literary critic in South Africa. Um, you... I uh, see now have an opinion column on LitNet and you're known as a reviewer and a critic. Do you ever feel, as a writer yourself who's putting yourself out there in that space, do you ever feel hesitant to give your unfiltered opinion of a book? Do you ever feel as though 
this is something that could come back to bite you because it seems to me that you are completely fearless. But have you ever had moments of doubt and, like and I'm that? And go- I'm going to throw into that also that, that knowing because you are a writer and you know how hard it is. You know whether you like the book or not. It was mm. hard work for the writer. Mm. Well, guys, to be honest, I feel it each time I, I, I start a review. And I was like, as a writer, people are going to think, oh, you're being jealous uh, because your your book is not successful. And uh, I resent that because uh, I told you I read a lot. And uh, one of the reasons why I like uh, reviewing books is because it forces me to read. So I have to make time to read because I want to keep up with mm. what is being written. Mm. <clears throat> The unfortunate thing about uh, being a an avid reader is that you can pick up the flaws mm. of uh, of of writing processes in novels very quicker than other people. You understand? And so I've made it a rule uh, in in my litnet column never to talk about books I did not like. Okay. So that's, so that's the first that. rule. That's yeah. the first rule I have. Right. If I don't, I didn't like the book. I don't talk about it. Right. I only talk about books I've, I've I've loved, and of course, books I've loved. I also have what I call constructive criticism mm-hmm. of them, which I would like even people to do that in my own books, mm. yes. because sometimes it helps when a person just comes to your book and say, "But I I love this book. It was great here. It was great here. It was great here." Peter about this floor and, and this floor and this floor. And also reading is a subjective thing. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know why uh, most writers, especially uh, South African writers and generally African writers, take uh, umrage when you you criticize mm-hmm. a book. That is a subject thing. They're, they're, they're books. I'm like, I look at them, just a synopsis, and I think and it, it's not something that's going to appeal to me. You understand? Even though as as a reader, I like to read outside of my comfort zone. Mm-hmm. But sometimes I look at a book and say, no, it's not going to work for me. So I have too many books to read, so I cannot waste my time. And so, but I, I, I try to be fair in a sense that I give every book at least 50 pages. Okay. If it does not attract me, it does not consume me within that 50 pages, I, I have a lot of books to read and I cannot, and I've, I've got other things to do. I need to write also. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I need to work there, other things. So I cannot be, my, my time is very, very precious. So if after 50 pages, it does not grab me, I DNF it. Okay. Mm. So on that subject, um, we always like to ask, what have you been reading or listening to or watching lately that has made an impression on you? Ah, <laughs> should I start with the, uh, uh, let me let me finish with the books. Listening, I always listening to podcasts. And these days I, I find that I cannot, uh, it's the only thing that uh, Keeps me sane on traffic, Cape Town traffic, mm-hmm. <laughs> and the podcasts and uh, yeah, your podcast also. I listen to it a lot, oh, so I don't lovely. think I miss I miss I miss an episode. Apple always reminds me about that, and but of course, uh, my bias on on podcasts is, is literature, of course, naturally, and um, yours and Jonathan uh, Ball podcasts in South Africa, I think, are quite good in literature. So I those those are my favorite listening to. And then um I don't really watch TV, but uh I watch news on TV and or listen to them to radio. But I do I I do watch services. So I would uh especially if a, a series is reviewed on on the journals that I read uh, I read uh a journal, which is a Catholic journal called The Tablet, which I was like, is based in the UK. And then I read the London Review of Books and then sometimes the New York Review of Books, although it bores me these days. But <laughs> wait, that's a topic for another time. So that's how I get to know what's on TV. And then I would like, okay, that sounds interesting. And then I would download that mm-hmm. and then on, on, on Apple or something. And then uh, Sundays in particular, I, I, I like uh, after Sunday dinner to watch something just while away time. So uh, I watch those, and then I think the one I've 
still uh, resonate on my head now is Shogun. That was a beautiful series. It taught me so much about Japanese culture that I did not know. That was my favorite uh, so far. Uh, I was liking Presumed Innocent and then it kind, kind of bored me towards the end. <laughs> I think uh, the thriller tropes were all there when they, they were using us to showcase but like this episode, you must suspect this one is the one who killed and all that stuff. And the only thing I asked of them is that but don't make that particular character to be a killer. And then they made that particular character <laughs> to be a killer, and that irritated me <laughs> in the end. But that was on the last episodes. Yeah, that's those 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 what I, I'm I'm watching. I yeah, a few days ago I watched a, a Netflix African thing called The Lobola Man. It's very funny. Uh, it's uh, if you don't like the first thirty minutes is quite boring, so don't despair. But after that, <laughs> it, it, it gets to the point. So it's this guy who, who, who makes it his, uh, his, his gig to be a Lobola negotiator. Okay. So if, if I'm, I'm getting married to you, Fiona, for instance, I will, I will hire him to go and negotiate Lobola for me. And he's very good. And he, he is a shoddy character, of course. And then, uh, book wise, uh, I got a book actually. I'm, I must mention this so that, uh, People don't think I'm biased or prejudiced because I I review books mm. for Litnet, so I get books from publishers, mm. and I think now they are also kind of learning the kind of books that I like because initially the kind of books they send me are like so, but they they know it's my condition even on them. If I don't like it, I won't talk about it. You understand? So Picador sent me this one only big bomb. Bam Bam Matters Tumor. It's a novel by uh, Damile Kuku. She's a Nigerian, but I think she lives in in, in the US. I don't know. But uh, I don't think she, she lives in, in Nigeria. Look, naturally, this wouldn't be my type of, of, of book because it's about this character who's obsessed about uh, doing surgery to do big bombs like uh, the Kardashians or, mm. or mm. whatever, beyond so so. You understand? But then sometimes, as I said, I like to force myself to read uh, outside my comfort zone. It is very funny. <laughs> it is very funny. And uh, I'm on early stages of it. Uh, but I'm finding it very funny. And uh, I mentioned this one about uh, Andrew O'Hagan. He, he is a, a Scottish writer. I think his, his first book was Mayflies. Because I have read that. I think my wife once gave me that and I read it. And uh, the, the funny thing about this title, Caledonian Road, it just immediately appealed to me. And if you know the Scottish uh, literature, you would immediately uh, relate it to the Crow Road of uh, Iron Banks, which is very yes. popular in the UK, was very a classical uh, book on the UK. So I thought uh, he is probably making a riff on that. And uh, I'm reading it very slowly because it's a very good book. It's well written. The, the, the prose narrative is clean. Mm -hmm. It's like looking into Pelosud River flowing. And uh, the experience uh, of him as an editor, you can see the, on the clean prose, it's so easy and yet profound. It's it's a beautiful book, but also I try to make sure that I I keep up with what is happening within the UK, literally, especially on the Scottish, because uh, it's a, it's a this this book is it's what you'd call perhaps discursive literature, because he he he, he tackles issues of the day one by one and uh, it's so beautiful also to see how even before uh, the Tories lost he had already seen that what is going to happen all their decadence and the decay mm. because uh, the sister of a uh, protagonist of the book who is a, a professor and an art critic professor uh, is an MP yeah, an, a Labour MP you understand? And he, he has a, a deep uh, way of writing empathically. He's got a, a sense of empathy that I love. And 
I is my only condition. I always say that if you are going to write about experiences that are not yours, at least write it with a sense of empathy. Mm. You understand? So that those people don't get angry and accuse you of misappropriating their experiences. And he has all that. It's, it's such a rich book. Uh, one day, I'm sure you would you would agree with me when they they say it's a it's one of the British classics. I think it's destined to be that. Well, that's that's definitely one for the to be read yeah. pile. <laughs> Push, thank you so much for your time. We hope that everyone will seek out and read the Broken River Tent and the Wanderers, and we're very much looking forward to your next book. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, guys, for inviting me. I know we've been doing it up and down, and it's been, uh, and I'm so glad that when I came this week, you were able to find space for me. Oh, thank you very much. Such a pleasure. Thank and you. And keep doing what you are doing. We thank appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Gail, I saw you taking a lot of notes during our discussion with them, Push. What did you take from that? I found Push so fascinating. You know, I really, we meet such amazing people on this podcast. But one of the things that I found fascinating about him is the way he's so immersed in history and his part of history, those frontier wars, like it's like he read about them all yesterday mm. and he's excited about them and he can talk about the strategy of them and he's he's so immersed in it and it fascinates me because I'm not a person particularly interested in history. But when I listened to him talk, I got all like, oh, I want to write a historical novel. Mm -hmm. Like, make no mistake, I do not want to write a historical (laughs) novel. But he's so passionate about it. And that passion translates into the writing and the writing experience. And that, that really interested me. Well, I think part of that passion has to do with his process. Mm. You know, what he described in the way that he... He lets the idea build up in his mind until it's literally overflowing, and then he writes it all out in a a big gush, Mm. which often involves staying up all night Mm. to write. Mm. And that is also so interesting. So interesting. Reminds me a bit of Intiking Moshlele, who also described how he writes when the spirit Mm. moves him. He doesn't write as a daily discipline thing. Such a foreign thing for you and I, but quite inspiring listening to people who are that driven by what's going on in their heads. Yes, because I think that if I wasn't doing the daily discipline thing, I would also have a release valve that would have to you know, be triggered after a while because I do think stories would build up in me if I weren't regularly letting them out. I agree, but I do think I, it would be a messy, messy process for me <laughs> if, I, if, I wasn't, if I wasn't disciplined about it. Yeah, that gush of creativity <laughs> might actually make a bit of a, a disaster <laughs> if I, you let it out in an uncontrolled way. So we have a very interesting question from a listener today. And this is as follows. This question's coming to us from East London. Um, the person didn't leave their name. And they said, Hi, Gail and Fiona. I have sent my first novel out to numerous agents and publishers. I've had it read by my friends and family. And the information I'm getting is that it's just not good enough. This book is not gaining traction anywhere. Should I quit writing? You know, Fiona, this one is something I feel quite passionately about, that you often see people who've written a first novel and rework it and rehash it, and that first novel is not good enough. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean they're not a writer, and it doesn't mean the second novel won't be great. And look at and push. Yes, that's true. The Wanderers is actually the novel he wrote first. Yes. So he, he was able to come back to that with the learning of the second novel and make the first novel better. So it could be the first novel needs to be put away. You need to write a second novel. Doesn't mean the first novel is necessarily going to be a write-off, although in both, in both our cases the first novel was mm, a write-off. Indeed. Um, but it doesn't mean it has to be. Put it away. Write something else. And Push's experience went as far as that novel was actually rejected. Yes. It was judged not good enough. Publishers were not interested in it. But now it's out there and it 
it was long listed for the Sunday Times. Brian. Exactly. <laughs> Which also shows don't take other people's rejection too much to heart. But at the same time, maybe it is a crap book and that's okay. It doesn't mean you're not a writer. Yeah, I think people just get too invested in that mm. first book. It's mm. Maybe they've put a lot of themselves and their personal experience mm. into it and they feel as though a rejection of that first book is in some way a rejection of them as a human being. A hundred percent. And it's very hard to move on from that. A hundred percent, but I think really, really important. The first book is like the first pancake. You've got to throw it away often. Yeah, and then the second book can be the one that really gets Mm. you success. Mm. So to our listener, we would say, no, don't quit writing, but maybe do quit quit writing that book. Quit (laughs) writing that book and and tinkering with it and working with it and and, and stop sending it out and just get going on the 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 second book because there's no distraction as fun as working on Mm. the next book. Mm. And I think also if you really are a writer, that next story is probably sitting there waiting, nagging at you, scratching. Let it out. It's, it's time. Okay. I like that. I like that a lot. We hope everyone checks out and pushes books. That is The Broken River Tent, which was published by Blackbird Books, and The Wanderers, published by Quela. They are both still in print and available, and we're looking forward to his next book. You've been listening to another production from Solid Gold Podcasts.